last 13 years, startups overwhelmingly prefer to build on top of AWS. We have the largest number of services, making it easy for you to take on some of the biggest challenges with the smallest teams. We also have partnerships with the top VCs, accelerators, and incubators around the world, making it easier to secure your next round of funding. I'm a solution architect uh, with the AWS uh, Ed Start uh, program. Uh, what we do is we work with startups in the uh, education sector, and we help them build their uh, uh, services on AWS. So We Power Tech is AWS's diversity and inclusion outreach program. The program is really twofold. One is to increase the number of underrepresented technologists within the industry, and the second is to provide a platform for them to be seen and heard. If you're wondering how the AWS evangelism team might be able to help your startup, there are many ways. We're technically credible across our entire catalog of products, so we can help you figure out which services might be able to meaningfully impact your business. We also want to help tell your story. So if you're building something cool, we want to know about it and help spread that message to the world. So you might end up on stage at an event like AWS Summit. If you're a startup, you should also definitely check out the AWS Lofts. These are event spaces that are free to anyone with an AWS account. And you can treat them like co-working spaces, but the awesome thing about them is that we also have people like technical evangelists like myself, solutions architects that come and give hands-on technical workshops and sessions to help you learn how to more effectively utilize the AWS products and platforms that you're already building on top of. We are a dedicated team of people that love startups. That we just want to come and help you with whatever we can, whether it be technical or business focused. We are here to help guide you and make sure that you know you do have a say in what's going on. We do get your feedback. We do bring that feedback to the service teams. That is what we're here for. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Hello, everybody. Uh, thank you so much for being here this afternoon. I'm hoping, or I assume it's afternoon or evening for most people on this call. Um, let's start out by giving a little shout out about where you are calling in from. Um, I am Grace Lancaster. I run events and um, speakers at Startup Grind, and I am in Oakland, California. Um, and our speaker is up in Vancouver. So, oh wow, we got someone from Australia. That's great. Very cool. Thank you, everyone. Awesome. So many people from so many places. Love it. Um, so today we have a very special workshop that is being hosted uh, by a friend of Startup Grind, Yancy Strickler. Um, Yancy is a writer, and he's also the co-founder and former CEO of Kickstarter. He grew up in Virginia, and he began his career as a music critic in New York City, did a little bit of a shift, and then uh, founded Kickstarter, and he recently just authored a book called This Could Be Our Future, a Manifesto for a More Generous World. Today, Yancy's going to do a workshop on self-awareness. Um, and it's going to be very interactive, so I would suggest grabbing a notebook and a pen um, because there'll be an opportunity to get some notes down, think about yourself in this self-awareness workshop. And if um, there are some questions that you want to send in, yes, you'll take some time at the end of his uh, workshop to chat through some things. So I will let Nancy take it away from here. Uh, thanks, Grace. Uh, what's up, y'all? Thanks for hanging out today. I, I appreciate it. I'm going to share my screen. And uh, as Grace shared, um, there is going to be a, a journaling interactive part of this that we're going to get into in about 15 minutes or so. So if you have something to write on, that would be great. But I, I first wanted to start by talking about an, an interesting book. It's called The Fourth Turning. And in this book, it's a it's sort of a, a, a theory about how the world changes. And, and one of the central discussion points of the book is what is the nature of time? And the book offers three theories of time. The first theory of time is that time is cyclical, that we are constantly circling back to the same things over and over again. And the most the clearest evidence of this are the seasons that just every year just switches from season to season, the days change, the you know, time changes, and that really this is the nature of life. And the authors contend that up until about the Renaissance, everyone saw time as being cyclical. And the first people who started to count years had to argue why it was even worth tracking what year it was, because for most people, life was just a loop. 
Now, the second theory of time is that time is progressive. As time goes on, things get better. There is technological progress. There's a growth in knowledge or standard of living. This was something that really only emerged with the Renaissance and the Enlightenment, the advancement of technologies, the improvement of people's ways of life, all that really started happening uh, and has led to the view of time that we generally have today, which is that things get better. Now, the third view of time is that time is just chaos, that any attempt we make to put any meaning upon time is just a narrative, that time is entropy, that things just sort of uh, break apart as things go. Now, there's a fourth theory of time that I, I think is also worth considering, and it comes from a book called The Artist's Way by Julia Cameron. This is a self-help guide to artists, and it has this idea that it returns to that touches on this point. Julia Cameron notes that the, the kinds of struggles that we have tends to be the struggles that we keep having. She writes, you will circle through some of the same issues over and over, each time at a different level. There is no such thing as being done with an artistic life. Frustrations and rewards exist at all levels on the path. Our aim here is to find the trail, establish our footing, and begin to climb. In this wonderful quote from Julia Cameron, we hear two of those notions of time come together. You will circle through the same issues and you will begin the climb. And so Cameron brings these two metaphors together and suddenly we see time as a spiral. We are constantly circling issues, but every time we do, we have the opportunity to make a better choice, to manifest some larger goal. And that when we think of time in this way, it allows us to be prepared for things that may come. The authors of The Fourth Turning note that back in the pre-Renaissance time, no one worried or tried to debate that winter wasn't coming. Everyone saw the truth that there were times of riches and times that were more fallow. But in a point of view where time is progressive, that we can only buy into this notion that things must get better. And then we find ourselves unprepared when things go awry. Now we're in one of those moments right now where things are going awry, when we're in a, a massive crisis from COVID-19, of course. And this is a talk about the importance of self-awareness in a crisis. And, and, and I recognize that self-awareness in a crisis sounds like a luxury, like Prada and a pandemic. But I think that this, this level of awareness is key to surviving and thriving in moments like this one. When the outbreak happens or the zombie apocalypse comes, in the movies, everybody runs away. We all have the same reaction to flee. But it always ends up that some people, some smaller number of people, don't just run away from the scary thing. They run towards something with a plan. In the movies, this is normally Tom Cruise. Tom is racing to save his family and or the world. So what separates Tom from all the other characters, the NPCs in the movie? Well, it's, it's scripts, a lot, a lot of things are, are there, but I think one of the things that the Tom Cruise character has is a clearer view of his self-interest than everyone else. While others are just thinking about getting away, he's thinking about some larger purpose. Now, the way we visualize self-interest today is through the language of something like a hockey stick graph a chart of whatever we want, popularity, wealth, power, is growing so fast the line slopes up and to the right. This, we think, is life's best case scenario. This is the uber goal that everyone is working towards. But when you take a step back, you see that this graph is actually just a small slice of a much larger picture because the x-axis representing time, it goes from now all the way into the future. And the y-axis measuring our self-interest, it also keeps going. It goes from me to us. The difference between being single and having a family is enormous, or being a solo entrepreneur and having employees. The scale of our self-interest changes. So we can actually think of there as being four distinct spaces of our self-interest to think about. There's now me, what I want and need at this very second. This is how we tend to think of self-interest today, the need to be fed, the, the need to have money in the bank, just, just the basic needs of life. But there's also future me. Future me is the older, wiser version of you, the person that you hope to become. That person becomes real or not real every day based on choices you make. 
There's also in the top left, now us, our friends and family, our coworkers, the people that are most central to our lives. Our choices affect them and their choices affect us. And there's also in the top right, future us, your kids if you have them, or everybody else's kids if you don't. Every decision we make leaves a footprint in all of these spaces. We shape them all the time. We shape the next generation. We shape the lives of others. But yet today, most of us operate with a point of view that says, now me is the only real space. Everything else is nebulous or emotional, not as real as that very individualistic notion of self-interest. Now, the first time I drew this graph, I thought, what is this a picture of? And I just wrote a very simple description next to it, beyond near-term orientation. This is a simple two-by-two two graph that would help you see beyond that now me perspective. And as I looked at what I'd written down, I realized those letters made an acronym that spelled bento. And I thought, oh my goodness, the, the bento box, the Japanese packed lunch that has four or five compartments, each carrying a different dish. The bento allows you to have a a diverse and balanced meal, not too much of any one thing. And the bento also honors a Japanese dieting philosophy called hadahachibu, which says the goal of a meal is to be 80% full, that way you're still hungry for tomorrow. Bentoism is the same idea, but for our values and self-interest, a way to not just indulge in now me, but a way to create space and conscious thought about all dimensions of who we actually are and where our self-interest resides. Now, the bento is not just a, a theoretical thing. It's an actual tool that you can use to make decisions. So let's imagine a smoker asking their bento, should I quit smoking? Now, to use this, the smoker just asks each of these boxes individually what it has to say, because each one will have a different perspective based on its point of view. So for a smoker asking their now us, should I quit smoking? Their now us says, yeah, your family hates it. Like we all want you to quit. The smoker asks their future us, should I quit smoking? And they say, yes, imagine if your kids smoke because of you. The smoker asks their future me, should I quit smoking? The future me says, yes, you should quit. I want there to be a future me. But when the smoker asks their now me whether they should quit, the now me says, no, don't quit. I'm addicted to nicotine. Quitting's going to suck. And this is where we get stuck because that now me has a rational point of view based on its very limited perspective. It will be bad for now me to quit smoking, even though it will be good for every other dimension of who you are. So when we're trapped in this passive awareness, as we are today, we only see outcomes from the perspective of what they do for now me. And the other spaces, again, are not seen as being very real or important. And this leads us to make all kinds of bad decisions. It can make something like addiction or sort of acts of desperation that are good for now me, but bad for every other part of you, look defensible, look rational. It can also make sacrifice, giving up something as an individual on behalf of others or giving up something now on behalf of the future that looks unthinkable and irrational, even though we once viewed sacrifice as one of the most virtuous acts a person could do. What we really need then is an act of awareness a mentality that is consciously thinking about all areas of who we are and is actively integrating them into our decision-making, our planning, everything about how we spend our time. Now, this is especially easy to do if you know what your values and priorities are in each of these spaces. And there's just a very simple question to ask to find out. Now me, what do I want and need on a day-to-day -day basis? What does my future me want me to do? When I first went through this process, I wrote down just a lot of different ideas, just as we're going to do momentarily, of just things that felt important to me when I asked myself this question. And then I ended up shortening that down to a set of simple phrases that I could remember, little slogans to keep this in mind. So my now me value, my, my priority in now me is to show people the matrix. When I wrote down all the things I need uh, to be happy and fed, intellectually fed, you know, feed my family, this is what came down as the most core to what I am. My future me, that voice is always telling me to create harmony. I'm a child of divorce, so I'm always trying to bring people together. But also to not sell out, to never put money above my values. 
my now us, what is my core value there? Well, I, I'm hyper present with a small group of friends. I, I, I'm very deep time, focused time. I, I never look at my phone when I'm with you. And my future us, what's the world I'm working towards? Not a world where there isn't a matrix, but a world where there is a better matrix that is operating to our benefit. And so once I wrote down these values, and I'm, I'm looking at it right now on my desk as a way for me to think about my decisions, I started actively incorporating it into the choices that I was making. So a, a real example is I sometimes get asked to do talks for companies, and sometimes they're not companies that I'm particularly a fan of. And in the past, every time I'd been asked to do this, I'd said no. You know, I, I felt like a sellout for doing a talk for some company whose values I didn't agree with. But I got asked to do another one of these shortly after thinking of bentoism. So I asked my bento this same question. And my bento, when I asked my uh, now us, or my, sorry, my now me, my now me, which wants to show people the matrix, says, yeah, doing a talk, like, that sounds great. Yes, we're in. When I asked my now us, should I do a talk for a company I don't like? It says, we like deep time, focused time, an hour and a half to talk about ideas. That's cool with us. My future us, which wants to build a better matrix says, absolutely, you should do this talk. Like you can't just preach to the choir. And my future me, which reminds me to create harmony, to not sell out, that voice though said, no, I shouldn't do it. And it accused me of being a sellout for even considering it. And suddenly that voice in the past that had always told me, that it always felt kind of angry at even being asked to do a talk like this, I could see it for what it was. It was my future me voice. And I suddenly imagine my future me as this bouncer, this big dude standing outside that was stopping things from coming in that I thought would violate my values, that my future me was looking out for me. But because I could have this active awareness of seeing everything that was going on here, I had the agency to tap that bouncer on the shoulder and say, no, 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 it's cool, let this one in. And I could do so not violating who I am, but actually being coherent with who I am, making a 180 degree different decision and still being fully in line with who I most deeply am. And that's the kind of benefit you get with cultivating this kind of active self-awareness. And so now this is something that we're going to do together. So uh, if you have a piece of paper and a, and a pen, um, you can also just write on your phone or a computer if that's fine. But I would love you to draw a bento, leave the inside of each of these spaces blank. We're gonna end up writing in these, but draw the four boxes of now me, future me, future us, and now us. I'll give you just a second to do that. And then I'm gonna lead us in a little meditation um, to help you better visualize what's going on here for you. Um, let's just give you one minute to write down. All right, so I'd love for everyone to um, sort of get settled in your chair and sit, sit straight. And we're gonna close our eyes together. And I just want your head to please be pointed straight forward, eyes shut, looking straight forward. Now I'd like us all just breathe in through our nose and out through our mouth three times together. Keeping your actual eyes shut, I want you to imagine you're opening your mind's eye, that you're allowing your brain to become very aware. And your brain is now looking straight ahead into a mirror of you at this moment. It's looking at a now me of you right now. And the mind's eye of your brain can scan your body and you can see how your emotions are, whether you're feeling happy or upset. It can look at your body and feel like, notice if your body's feeling like it needs to exercise or if it's feeling tired. You can look at your mind and see if you're feeling restful or anxious. Let's just take a moment and let that mind's eye just scan our now me in the mirror and see what it notices. Now I'd like you to lift your chin slightly and imagine you're looking up into the second story of a building and we're looking into the space of now us. In this room, I, I want you to picture all the people that are important to you. 
your family, your friends, your coworkers, your pets, just like your, your core crew. And I want you to picture each of those people and then cram them together on a couch. It's the tight fit, but cram them all together on the couch. And now take a Polaroid. And now let's look at the faces of that picture and just register each of those faces. I'd like you to turn your eyes again to eye level, your head to eye level, and now turn to the right. Now we're looking at the space of future me. Future me is the older, wiser version of you. More salt and pepper in your hair. I want you to imagine you're looking at your future me. It's standing on some cliff somewhere. Wind is blowing through its hair. Your face is more wrinkled, it's a little softer. Now I want you to imagine walking up to that future me, this future version of you, and taking your hand and just looking into your eyes, looking into that face. And I want you to feel the warmth and compassion that future me feels for you. The same way that you look back on your adolescent self as someone who is just doing the best they could in a hard situation. That's how your future me looks at you right now. And they look at you with absolute love and compassion because they know that you're on a path to becoming them, to becoming the person that you can be. And finally, still turning to the right, I want you to lift your eyes up, lift up your chin, and we're looking into the space of future us. This is that same Polaroid that you took a moment ago, but now 10 years into the future. Everyone in the picture is older. If you have kids, they're giant. If you don't have kids, maybe you have them now. As you look at the picture closely, you notice that some people aren't in the photo anymore. And that there are some people who you haven't seen before, but you know they're important because they're there. As we look at this photo, I want you to imagine that the people in that image are telling you that the decisions that you make right now, this week, today, affect them, that our choices have an impact. I want you to look at those faces and try to imagine them as best you can. All right, now you can keep your eyes shut just for a moment longer looking again straight ahead. And I just want you to try to feel all four of those spaces, the fact that they're all a part of you, that you're holding all of them, and that you exist right at the center of them. That we're standing on a line, it's like a meridian between now and the future. We're always, always moving between those spaces. And this bento helps us see what's really going on. All right, you can open your eyes. And now we're gonna look at that piece of paper with these four spaces on it. And we're gonna spend the next couple of minutes just filling out what's there for you. And we're gonna start with now me. Now me is the box in the bottom left. And that's the, just you right this second. You could think of now me as the more selfish part of you. It's the part of you that you know wants to get good rest, needs your exercise. It also um, you know, needs money. It, it, it has its core needs that must be met. When I answered this question, what do I want to need my now me? I said, I need good health. I need money in the bank, a sustainable lifestyle, happy to be emotionally grounded. Um, I like you to just think, you know, to be good on a day-to-day -day level, what are the six or seven things that just stand out to you as the things that are important for you to think about? All right, I'm gonna put one minute on the clock and you're gonna journal that, that down on your piece of paper. All right, you can go ahead and get started.
Next is future me. So future me is that box in the bottom, right? This is the older, wiser version of you, the obituary you wish you could have. I think of it as my inner Obi-Wan Kenobi. As you picture that person, as you feel them looking at you, as you hear what wisdom they might offer, what, what do they say is important? What, what do they say are the disciplines, the values, the traits, the things to hold on to, to end up in that place where you, you ultimately want to be? When I asked myself this question, my answers were things like being loyal to my values and people, uh, being curious, being hungry to learn, being able to self-correct, see the bigger picture. What is it when you look in that future version of yourself, the person that you want to become, what are their mantras? What are the things that are most important to them? So let's take one minute and see what comes to mind. Next, we're gonna to go to the top left to now us. You saw your now us, they were the people on the couch sitting together. I want you to try to think about those relationships and ask yourself, what's at the heart at your relationships? What kind of friend are you to your now us or, or child or parent? Are you the shoulder to cry on? Are you the creative problem solver? Are you the friend who's just always there for people? Um, what is at the heart of your relationships? What is most core to the value you bring to the other people in your life? Let's take a minute and write down the things that come to mind. Finally, we have in the top right, future us, your kids, if you have them, or everybody else's kids. Think about what is that future us world that you want to be working towards? What is it that future needs versus what we have now? When I answered this question, I said a safe, safe and healthy environment, uh, a world smarter, more knowledgeable, not corrupt, just collaborative, loving, what is that bigger picture for you? Let's take a minute and write that down.
All right, you should now have in front of you something like that bento I first showed with sort of scribbles in each of these boxes. As the next step for you would be to look at those boxes and try to look for the central themes and, and try to find maybe a simple phrase you could remember to begin to incorporate this into your thinking. I'll, I'll have more to say about that in just a moment. But the, the real opportunity here is to, by knowing what's going on and what, what's important to you in each of these spaces, it allows you to make decisions and act in a way where you're trying to manifest that future version. You're, tr you're trying to manifest some larger idea. You're treating a crisis as not a bespoke thing where you're trying to solve a new solution, but you're using it as an opportunity to manifest some larger goal. And in a world where so few people have any foresight or exercising any foresight or thinking about the future at all, to have that perspective gives you just a tremendous advantage. And when we can see all four of these spaces, we have the potential to create decisions that are self-coherent. And by this, I mean decisions that really line up with every part of who we are and what we care about. And when we make decisions like these, we are infinitely more effective. We're so much more powerful at things that we are naturally good at or naturally care about than things that we do not. And being able to sculpt a life in your time and approach your projects in a way that reflects what's important to you is really the path to having a kind of a transcendent impact even. Now we can think of the bento as a way to unpack maybe how some other people have made decisions. So as an example, I've made the bento for Madonna, the pop star Madonna, just a guess here. I think Madonna's now me values might have been taking back female sexuality. She was removing sexuality from the patriarchy, from the male gaze, and she was always owning it herself instead. Madonna's future me value, what is that sort of mantra her future self is telling her? It's saying, never repeat yourself, always do something different. This is how with every Madonna album or song or video, she was seemingly somehow someone entirely new and yet always becoming more Madonna at the same time. Madonna's now us, her constituency she's thinking about, you know, when she was making her art and her pop music, she was thinking of downtown New York City. She was thinking of, you know, the gay people of, of, cult, of color, you know, techno, electronic scene, just like what, what is New York City cool and, and making things that those people would like. That was her audience she was thinking of. And then she was always picturing herself as this icon, even down to her name, this thing that's larger than who she was. And I, and I think that if you think about this kind of framework, you can imagine Madonna making choices, always trying to satisfy each of these expectations and doing that might sculpt the kinds of choices that she made. It also, I think, defends how Madonna's recent exploits like doing weird naked Instagram live videos are actually very on brand for Madonna and very much fit her bento. Uh, and the fact that she's in tabloids again for being controversial, I think is a good thing, even now that she's in her 60s. Uh, this bento also applies to, to companies and organizations. The same boxes map to the needs uh, of the organizational structure. They, they just vary very slightly. For a company's now me, that's its mission and really its livelihood. Every company's now me has there's the core function we provide, and then that function needs to be paid for in some way. If you're a for-profit company, it's that you are making money, you're operating the black. If you're a nonprofit, it's that you have enough funding sources to continue to, to do what you're doing. The future me for an organization, that's, those are your values, and those are often pretty well expressed as the brand promise what it is a customer, the consumer gets by participating in your product. So Nike's Just Do It is a kind of a iconic example. Uh, the now us for a company, those are your stakeholders. You have a bunch of them. They're your customers, your employees, your investors, your community members, the professional networks that you're a part of. And for each of those stakeholders, there's a promise that you're trying to fulfill, an expectation to your employer, employees, you want to be this, to your customers, you want them to know you'll always be this for them. And once you set those expectations, set those promises, it's your job to then meet or exceed those to remain healthy in the us space of your organization. And for a company, it's future us is its vision statement, where it wants the world to be in 10 years. A computer on every desktop was Microsoft's one uh, that was so powerful. And this bento for an org is incredibly revealing. Here we can imagine Apple 
So here's Apple's mission. Apple's mission statement is tools for the mind that advance humankind. It's values. I'm, I'm seeking it down to just think different. Apple's always had a unique customer promise where going back to that uh, Apple versus DOS days in the 80s, Apple was always the just works technology. You don't have to read a manual to use an Apple product. They've also leaned hard on user privacy and being a walled garden. And what's that larger vision that Apple's working towards? It's an advanced humankind because they want its mission to have an impact, but it's also a bigger Apple, like Apple wants to grow. There is a self-interest here, of course. And so we can map this, those ideals, which are already defined by Apple, onto their bento and use it as a way to make decisions. So if we think about a recent Apple success and a recent Apple failure, we can see how powerful this lens is. The success would be the Apple AirPods. The AirPods uh, satisfy the now me goals for Apple. Uh, I mean, it's, just a, it's a tech product that is providing some growth for them. It, it solves this future me uh, expectation of thinking different, right? The AirPods were like had a new form factor, Bluetooth only, really a, a new product space. The AirPods are also amazing at this now us customer expectation of being this just works technology, syncing them to your phones, pretty simple. You put them in, they just play, you take them out and they just stop. Like it's kind of magical in that way. And it fulfills this Apple vision statement of also growing the company. So the, the AirPods are a big success. A failure on, their hand, other, on the other hand would be the Apple Touch Bar, the little strip that was on a laptop. Yes, it thinks different. However, it doesn't just work. The number one complaint from your viewers was that the, the Touch Bar had no real function. So it actually wasn't an, a, a really a quintessentially Apple product, despite fulfilling arguably three of these four spaces. But because it missed that one, it lacked that coherence and lacked the potential, uh, lacked the opportunity to, to meet its full potential. And so this kind of passive awareness is important to see beyond because basically every company is trying to grow. They're trying to satisfy their now me needs. They're, they're pursuing profitability. But what companies are not seeing is that the way you get there is by how good a job you do of thinking of your now us, how good a job you do of defining your values and then staying true to them. But this past awareness has trapped the business world and it's trapped culture overall. One of the ways that we see this now me mentality comes from a survey that UCLA has done of American college students every year since the 1960s. And one of the questions they ask is about these students' goals in life. And they're asked to rate a, a variety of potential life goals as to whether they're essential or, or not essential. And in 1970, the percentage of college freshmen who said being well off financially, being rich, it's the only question really dealing with money. The percentage of college freshmen in 1970 who said being rich was essential was 28%. In 1970, the most important life goal, according to college freshmen, was to, quote, develop a meaningful philosophy on life. 86% of college freshmen said that was essential or very important. In 2017, the last year this study was published, the percentage of college freshmen who said being rich was essential was 82%. The percentage who said having a meaningful philosophy on life was, was less than half. If we look at the change of values over the past 50 years, we could see that the biggest change by far has been the growth and the belief in becoming rich and the decline in the belief in finding a meaningful philosophy on life and seeking meaning in life. The same number of people want to be artists, the same number of people want to be good at their jobs, but this belief in, in money and being rich, this individualistic notion of self-interest has really become dominant in a way that you could just clearly see on this graph. And we've seen it in culture too. In the 1980s, the boomers were celebrated as the, the me generation. It was the me decade. They were the most individualistic people that had been seen in history until that point. And then we saw this just 10 years ago again with millennials also being accused as this hyper-individualistic, hyper-me-oriented uh, generation. But it's not the generations that are doing this, it's the larger culture. It's, it's this whole world that we're swimming in that has really become hyper-focused on this short-term individualistic notion of self-interest. And it is trapping us. It is trapping us from, it is blocking us from dealing with climate change. It is causing us to, to make many short-term decisions that only look good because we're only seeing now me. And if you look at the dominant institutions of the 20th century, you can actually see that they directly support different parts of the bento. There's the justice system, unions, churches, community ship, public spaces. Those are all now us spaces. They're there to make sure that people can come together. Future us institutions are universities, science, research. Future me institutions are pensions, 
multi-generation communities, workplace loyalty. Now us institutions are things like the police or military or providing economic opportunity. The one thing that's noticeable about the past 50 years is that the institutions in the now me space have improved. There's been a, a greater investment in those things. Improved is the wrong word, but a greater investment and emphasis on those things. But meanwhile, every other space of the bento has been in decline. And it's been because we've been trapped by this now me space. We can see that in each one of these bentos, there are different values that guide what is a good and a, a bad decision in those spaces. Now me tends to be driven by our desire for autonomy, to have freedom, our desire for pleasure, our desire for security, to feel safe. Our future me is, thrives on grit, on mastery, and trying to get better at something over the long term, over having a larger purpose. Now us is supported by community, fairness, tradition, things that connect us to one another. In the future us, we grow that space by focusing on awareness, knowledge, the sustainability of our actions. So this shift from a passive to an active point of view is the critical change that this moment requires of us. And the 21st century is gonna demand in a huge way. This is ultimately what Tom has. This is how Tom's getting away from the aliens. This is how Tom is saving the world, is being able to see this bigger picture, being able to see beyond the terror of this one moment and work towards a larger destination. And that is something that we all have the opportunity to do today. Now to, to do this, it's just about practice and getting used to this mode of thinking, getting used to these spaces. And the way I do this is that every week, I make my to-do list using the bento. And I thought we could do this here as a, a little last exercise. So if you want to draw one more bento on your piece of paper, um, same four boxes. And we're just going to use this uh, to ask how we should use our energy just in the next seven days. We're, we're only thinking a week ahead. We're going to ask each of these boxes what it is that we should do. And what you're, what you're going to find here is that our now me is going to have your errands, our work things we need to do. But when we ask these other spaces, we're going to hear different kinds of suggestions for how we use our time. And when I do this every week, afterwards, I make a literal to-do list laying out all these things so that my to-do list does not just include work things, but it's friends I need to be in touch with, books I need to read, ways I want to contribute to something larger. So if you have that written down, I'm, I'm going to lead us through this just for a couple minutes, um, and then we'll get to your questions momentarily. Um, but I'd like to start just by, you're looking at the now me space, putting one minute on the clock and you're asking, how should I use my energy in the next seven days? You're just asking your now me self, which is gonna think about Aaron's work, just like things you need to get done. So let's just take one minute and just jot down the main priorities that stand out for you there. I'm doing it too. All right, next, let's go to the now us, the top left space. And here we're just thinking, thinking about a picture of our people on the couch. Who do we need to give love to? Who do we need to spend time with? Who do we need to recognize or invest in in the next seven days? Who of your now us do you most need to sync up with? So let's take a minute and let's write down uh, what, what comes up there.
All right, next, let's look at future me. Future me, the bottom right box here, picturing that, that older, wiser version of us. Is that person, if you ask that person what you should be doing the next seven days, what do they tell you? Do they tell you some mantra like, don't worry what other people think? Or do they tell you to continue some tradition like keep up your daily writing habit? Um, what is it that your future me is telling you? Is it that something you should be learning? Let's take a minute and write that down. All right, last of all, future us, top right. Here, we're, gonna, we're asking, how should we use our energy in the next seven days to affect the future us that we want? And here, I'd be asking you to think about, imagine that the decisions that you make have a butterfly effect, that they set an example, good or bad for others, that say what you teach someone else or what you learn, um, that that has a material impact on the future. If that were true, if that were true, what, what would you want to use your energy for in the next seven days? Is it to become active for a cause? Is it, is it to change something in your neighborhood or your family? What is that for you? All right, so as the next step, I would encourage you to, to take what you've written down in these boxes and to look at how you can shift your time to, to meet what came up here. I've been doing this every day for almost a year, and the way I use my time has totally changed. I kind of think of every day now as I'm trying to take actions that fulfill each of these spaces. So I'm always calling a friend every day, for example. I'm really making a conscious effort to think about the rituals I'm continuing for my future me. So this level of conscious active awareness ha has been super helpful. And this is something that I, since COVID, have done every week on Zoom. So every Sunday, we get together on a chat like this one, and we do a weekly bento. We map out our week ahead, just as we did. And we also do exercises, group work together, exploring different ideas. We've now done, I think, 40 of these. So it's a, it's a strong community and would love for you to join. So if you just go to that URL, you'll just put your email address in and I send out the schedule each week. Um, so, so please hop on that. And then if you want to go deeper into building your Bento or into sharing this with someone else in your life, there's a website, bentoism.org, that goes through this whole process, very similar to some of the things we did here today. And we'll teach you more about how to use your bento. Um, now, the, I want to just close by talking about the, the macro impact of this. So in a world of where we only see now me, that's a world where financial value, money, is really the only rational form of value that we traffic in. We judge outcomes based on what it does to the financial bottom line. The only ideas that a business will invest in are ones that might prove to produce a good financial return. And this is true for many parts of life, not just business at this point. 
But I believe that this shift in self-interest from an individualistic short-term definition to a more bentoish perspective really opens up the doors of new values. And that the kinds of values you see on the right, community, sustainability, purpose, tradition, those things that show up in the other parts of the bento, those are gonna become more central to our decision-making. They're gonna do this because we're gonna to need to think of those values to solve the problems of climate change, to solve the problems of the lack of social trust that is destroying uh, many parts of the United States of the social fabric at this point. And that these, are value, these values will be things that we will even learn to define as metrics and that will be new things on dashboards to grow. And that these will come to be seen as just as important as financial value based on the context. And when you start to think of things this way, then you can start to imagine how, say, jobs might be different in the future. That, say, being a blogger or a citizen journalist can be thought of as providing real community kind of value. Or even that, say, being a neighborhood greeter or a non-violent social support petty dispute mediator. Or being an expert in rituals, uh, being a group ownership accountant, being a value steward, that, that ways of serving these other forms of need that we have in our communities and in our families and our lives, that these are things that, that are absolutely ways that we provide value to one another and can be future means of employment. Now, the shift here is an enormous one, and, and it's one that some experts have seen coming. This is a picture of John Maynard Keynes, the legendary economist, who wrote, when the, wealth, when the accumulation of wealth is no longer of high social importance, there will be great changes in the code of morals. We should be able to rid ourselves of many of the pseudo-moral principles which have hag-ridden us for 200 years. We shall be able to afford to dare to assess the money motive at its true value. The love of money as a possession as distinguished from the love of money as a means to the enjoyments and realities of life will be recognized for what it is, a somewhat disgusting morbidity. But beware, the time for all this is not yet. For at least another hundred years, we must pretend to ourselves and to everyone that fair is foul and foul is fair, for foul is useful and fair is not. Avarice and usury and precaution must be our gods for a little longer still, for only they can lead us out of the tunnel of economic necessity into daylight. So Kent is saying that for at least another hundred years, we must pretend that foul affair is foul. We must embrace greed. But at a certain point, we'll reach a moment where we can move beyond that. But he wrote these words, another hundred years, he wrote these words in 1930. So that moment he's talking about a century from then is right now. We are the ones who can make this turn. And another hugely important, very mainstream thinker, Peter Drucker, one of the most mainstream business writers of all time, wrote an amazing book in 1990 called The Post-Capitalist Society, where he, where he argued that by 2020, we would move beyond a place where financial capital was the most important form of capital, and then instead knowledge in many different forms would be the new dominant value that we would need to be growing. He says, this will not be an anti-capitalist society. It will not even be a non-capitalist society. The institutions of capitalism will survive, although some, such as banks, may play different roles. But their center of gravity in the post-capitalist society is different from the one that dominated the last 250 years. And this is this moment that we're in now. The center of gravity is moving. It's moving from now me to a more central place in the bento. It's because the problems that we face are forcing us to. We have no option to deal with climate change, to deal with collective problems. We need a new lens for thinking. And the bento shows us how this is going to play out and how it's played out in the past. If you imagine this bento is you, I've slightly relabeled these boxes. Now me is called you. Future me are your values. Your now us are your relationships. And future us, your kids, I call you too. Now let's imagine you have a kid. And let's build out their bento. And suddenly we can see the way that your value, the values of you and your partner form a foundation underneath that next generation. And that your relationships are a pulsive force that shapes them. Just as you two will do for you three and you three will do for you four. And just as our parents did for us. Now these values change and they change by generation. And the degree of change is affected by our awareness of what's happening. And in a universe we only see now me, our ability to affect what will happen in the future is greatly limited. But when we see what's going on and we step into this act of awareness, we create the potential to shape not just now, but to shape the future. 
The way we go from 28% of college students believing being rich is essential to 82% believing it's essential is this process of happening generation by generation. And as you can see, once you're aware of the self-awareness, once you can see what's going on in the bento, the shape it forms is a spiral, a spiral uh, where we're circling to these same issues, where as generations we're facing the same challenges, but because of our awareness each time we are manifesting a better version of ourselves and raising the ceiling of what's possible. My book, This Could Be Our Future, goes through all this in, in great depth. And if you'd love to, you'd like to learn more, you can join the Bentoism community. There's a Slack group. Many, many folks are involved. And you could also find me online at wisestrickler.com. Uh, and now I'd love to take your questions. See what's up. What's up? That was awesome. Thank you. I have my, my boxes. Nice. <laughs> That was great. Um, you are getting a, a lot of love in the chat. Um, people are finding it very helpful to do, do exercises like this. And I think a lot of the times people don't stop to, to have these reflective uh, opportunities because it feels, you know, maybe like a chore, but if you're going to do a to-do list for your week anyways, you may as well like really think about it as opposed to just what's going to affect you right away um let's see if there's any questions let's see yeah and doing that you know doing that like through the checklist to-do list kind of thing you know like we all have our areas where we're that are more natural to us you know yeah. for me like doing the weekly bento it's forcing say the now us to be central you know like maybe, maybe like my people is something that i would put you know i think of as like an extracurricular and instead that's become core to me and, and I think we all probably have our things like that. Yeah. Um, uh, Toffee asked, uh, what prompted you to come up with this model and how long did it take to refine it? Um, well, I mean, I spent like a, you know, years on Kickstarter, um, like grappling with the challenges of trying to make non-financially maximizing decisions um, and and trying to maintain a different value system in, in a larger world that had a different one. So that really started this off. And then I, uh, I spent, you know, a year and a half wanting to understand the history of how we defined value and self-interest. I was very interested in, in what was the justification for how we came to see things. And, um, and, and so I, I knew that my argument was going to be that we were looking at a small slice of the puzzle. Um, and I was maybe like a year into that research when uh, during the book writing process, I'd given myself a few weeks where I wasn't going to write. I was just going to let my brain do other things. And one day I gave myself the assignment to try to like draw a storyboard of my book. Like how simple can I make my book? And it was when do, I did that, that that hockey stick graph that I show in the talk happened. And it happened just the way I showed with like first and then making the lines longer. And that was the moment. And, um, and later that same day, I tried recording a video of myself explaining it, just like explaining the idea. Can I, can I explain it? And about a week later, um, I reached out to a friend who sometimes hosts at salons to ask her if I could do a talk in her living room because I just wanted to see if I could say these things in front of people without throwing up basically. And, um, and so, yes, yeah, so about a month, I'd say about a month after first having the idea, I was presenting it in front of about 35 strangers and trying to teach it and just seeing through that experience, like that they would reveal a truth. And, um, and people really, it really brought clear value and meaning to people. And, um, and it has continued to do. And, and um, there's an interesting challenge of uh, feeling quite self-conscious, being a person introducing a new ism into the world in 2020 or 2019. Yeah. Uh, uh, but the longer I'm on this journey, the less I think about that and the more it's just, um, there, it's really providing value to people. And so there is a need, there's, there's a, an incoherence people feel in their lives. There, there's a lot of things that we're having to balance. There's a lot of conflicts we have to avoid looking at mm -hmm. to feel sane. Mm -hmm. and, and there is a better way. There is, there is one, you know. With the influx, here's a question from an attendee that I think is really interesting. And 
want to see how it's affected your process, but the influx of technology and information, you know, instant information, has that affected, um, have going through this process of bentoism affected your usage of technology or, you know, are there things that you've chosen to do differently after realizing time and time again through your bento box that like has to do with technology and kind of the mm. industry that you were working in and all that kind of stuff? I'm a, you know, I'm a sinner. I'm a sinner. Uh, <laughs> like it's, it's a struggle, you know, social media, they're all relationships, right? Yeah. And they can be healthy or unhealthy relationships. So, um, you know, I wrote a piece a couple of years ago called the dark forest theory of the internet, trying to explore like why, why people have become more private in certain ways online. Um, yeah, I, you know, I, I'm generally, um, very positive about, um, the internet. I, I think that like all of the, uh, you know, really optimistic ideals of the early internet are all true. We just take them for granted now. Um, and that at a certain point, like the problem surface, and now we've been in a place of the last, you know, five to 10 years, but especially the last five years of seeing those problems, having very emotional feeling reactions to them. Um, but that ultimately, that's also, that's part of the truth uh, of what this new medium is, but that the ability for us to become a networked organism and a networked brain, I think COVID is showing us like the tremendous power of that. And again, many of these powers, I think we, we take for granted rather than appreciating um, what they do for us. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think generally Twitter's not a great thing for our brains um, and that it, it just, it becomes quite difficult to have your own thoughts yeah. when you are just swimming in a stream of everybody else's. And, yeah. um, and I will have a tendency to like, you know, at a millisecond of quote boredom, my brain will want to like go open and go look. Yeah. And it does do that. Um, but I, you know, it brings, it brings me nothing. It yeah. actually brings me nothing. And, um, but it's hard to remember. Yeah. Did you listen to that uh, daily episode where they interview uh, Jack Dorsey? No. Oh, that was interesting. Just kind of talking about like why Twitter was created and did they ever think it could get to where it is? And, and does he hope to make changes to the platform and what it's become and all this, um, mm. which is, which is interesting, but. Well, I think, yeah. I mean, I, I think he's a good, I think he's a good leader. I mean, I think that like tools like this, you want to have unemotional systemic leaders. It's right. like very emotional reactive leadership is much more dangerous right. in, in, a, in a company like that. So I think it is the right kind of leadership, but maybe these are not products that serve, that serve us all that well. Right. Um, but it's tough. You know, yes, yesterday my wife and I went for a hike all day, so I, I didn't use the computer all day. And of course, I got online for the first time at like nine o'clock and just so excited. What think of all the goodies I'm gonna find logging in after a whole day of not looking at and yeah, it was just amazing how empty, how empty all the calories were. Totally. Um and but yet if I had been in my computer, I would have spent all day like interacting with everything. And yeah. So it's it's a challenge. I I think there's a, yeah yeah I have other ideas for that but yeah it's 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 tough totally. Um, well, we have gone over the hour, so I'm gonna let you um, wrap up here. If you want to give one more shout out for the Bento Meetup group, the link there. I think people were definitely interested in that. Um, yeah so yeah please um, you know the. Yeah, the, the Zoom, I mean, sorry, the, the Slack group's a few hundred people. It's a great community, people all around the world. It's like just folks who are intrigued by this. And, and there is a larger, um, we call ourselves the Bento Society, and there's a larger mission here. And there is a 30-year a mission to redefine what the world sees as valuable and in itself interest. And I uh, am almost certain that that is going to happen and, and, and that the sorts of ideas we're talking about, the need to integrate collective and individual value-making, sense-making, now and future sense-making, this, these are things that are going to be so obvious that this will seem so boring in 30 years from now. Like none, It'll be as obvious and unspoken and assumed as individualism is today. Yep. And that we're, we're on that path and, and, and would love to have folks 
be a part of it because it's it, it's a, a huge swing, but I think just about the most meaningful thing you can do. And if you all were um, interested in his last few slides about capitalism and all the money dilemmas, um, check out Nancy's book. It's called This Could Be Our Future. Um, thank you so much for bringing your wisdom to our community. We really appreciate it. This will live on Facebook so people can come back and check it out whenever they need some inspiration. Um, but thank you for your time and hope to talk to you soon, Yancy. Thanks, Grace. Thanks for having, hanging out, everybody. Take care. Bye, everyone.